us Let the songs of the Lord rise among us Let the joy of the King rise among us Let it We talk all the time about how our faith, the way that we worship God, is something that we can do every single day. But we get to come together on Sunday. We get to worship and do this together and declare these truths from God's word. And I hope you're excited this morning. Walt is going to be bringing us the word. But I want to just set us again with scripture into a posture of worship. Matthew 6, 33. God is talking about how he knows what you need. He knows the things and he says the people of this world, they make that priority number one and they just go running after all of those things. But Jesus tells his disciples, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and the heavenly father knows what you need. All those things will be added. But I just want to encourage you this morning to as best you can take everything in your mind and just push it aside because right now Jesus is worthy and we're all here gathered together to give him praise and to offer him our attention, 
our focus and our worship. So would you join in the spirit of that verse in Matthew? Let's seek first his kingdom, his righteousness. Let's continue to worship as one church this morning.
Isaiah 61, prophecy about Jesus. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and proclaim freedom for the captives and the year of the Lord's favor on you. And I love this in the New Testament in Luke 4. Jesus gets called up in the synagogue to read this passage from Isaiah. And when he finishes reading this passage, he sets down the scroll and he says, today in front of your very eyes, this prophecy is fulfilled in me. And I want to read a little bit more of Isaiah 53. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering. Have you experienced suffering and pain in this life? Jesus was sent to carry your pain and bear your suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken and afflicted. Have you ever been abandoned by the people that should have had your back? Jesus was abandoned by all of us when he bore our pain and our suffering. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. So today we only trust in one name to save. There's no other name. There's no other thing out there that can save you. There's only one who bore your pain, your suffering, and your sins on the cross. And there's only one who came back to life. So I want to encourage you to take in these words. But if you're looking for healing, there's only one name where healing is found. Would you continue to sing with us? Your name is healing. Your 
Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. for this chance we have to gather as a family of believers. No matter how hard the week may have been, we can gather here and praise your name. Lift up your name in worship to give you all the praise that you deserve. Hide me behind the cross, God. Let the words I speak be your words. Let it speak to someone here today. Your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. This is my first time ever preaching two services, so let's see what happens. We may go off the rails, but we'll be all right. I, I, I'm, I'm calling it the youth pastor special, considering that I let everybody out a good 12 minutes early in the first service. So, and a few stories here and there, see what happens. But I love preaching. And I love being here to get to speak to y'all. Because 
The past two weeks, two weeks ago, I had the blessing and privilege to be a counselor for high school camp at Table Rock Camp. And that experience is one of those things that I just can't be quiet about. You ever had one of those God moments where you just can't help but share it? Because I got to see students from all across the state encounter the Holy Spirit. Get to witness Him move amongst them. See chains fall, lives be changed, hearts made whole. And I can't keep that to myself. I got to see that a couple months ago. Like Y'all know I became youth pastor between October and November, around that time span. And I got to go to follow. Take a group of kids up there to Cincinnati, Ohio. And I got a taste of that there. In a much bigger scale. But seeing students encounter the Holy Spirit through worship, through song, through hearing the word proclaimed, and then seeing them respond to it. So then... Going to Table Rock and having that experience, I can't help but share with y'all this morning. So I apologize. This is a fairly camp-heavy sermon. I promise there is a message here. Trust the process. But camp is amazing. I cannot overstate just how amazing camp is. Because camp in general, even in the secular world, camp is a formative experience for everyone involved. Even if you, if you just do the smallest amount of involvement at camp, you'll have an amazing week. Camp is amazing. It's where we get to experience so many different things that we would never get to experience outside of it. We bring together hundreds of random teenagers, form them into teams, and then by the end of five days, they have the tightest and most important bonds and relationships they will ever have in their young adult life. And these are these relationships that get renewed each and every summer as they see their friends again. And we count these memories and stories that they have. Camp is an amazing place. Because there's so many things that happen there that you wouldn't get outside of camp. Whether it be hiking, canoeing, archery, arts and crafts. Anything you can ever imagine can happen at camp. And I love camp. I grew up going to camp. I'm an Eagle Scout. So I grew up going to Boy Scout camp from middle school all the way to when I graduated high school. And that camp was amazing. I have so many different stories about that camp, the good, the bad, the ugly, the amazing, everything. One of my favorite stories is in Boy Scouts, you have a, rock, a wide range of merit badges that you get to do. And one of them is shotgun. So they have a whole gun range and we would shoot skeets. And to get the merit badge, you had to shoot however many, do some kind of difficulty thing. But the first day that we were there, there was a group of five of us. And this one kid was at the range. He had his shotgun loaded and ready to go. And he had a question. And normally, when you have a gun, you hit it, your head, to ask a question. Now, this child <laughs> pointed the gun downrange at all of us. And I've never seen a grown man move faster than this counselor snatch the gun out of his hand and send him back in. But that was camp. It was amazing. It was hot. It was miserable sometimes. The mosquitoes there mutated beyond the point of bug spray. We had to hike up a mountain to get to our campsite. But camp was amazing. I would not trade a week of that summer camp all those years for anything. But that camp, as amazing, as much as I learned those weeks at camp, that camp didn't change my life. It formed me here and there, gave me some memories, gave me some experiences, helped me learn a few things about myself, but it didn't change my life. My first year at church camp did change my life. See, there's something amazing Profound and life giving when you combine camp and all that can happen there and the Holy Spirit. So, when you combine those two things, you get this recipe for a catalyst. This moment in a student's lives where they will never be the same once they go to that church camp. 
Because that combination equals life change. That combination equals lives being saved and the Holy Spirit moving and students encountering the Holy Spirit. See, my job as youth pastor, my calling, is to help shepherd your students to God, to the gospel, to the Holy Spirit. So I cannot advocate for camp enough. It's an amazing thing. And I thank everyone who donated to help make camp basically pay for for these students. Camp changes lives. And that week at Table Rock was something completely different. That week, I saw the Holy Spirit move in such a way I don't think I can properly explain to you just what all happened. There's so many different stories, so many different things I can tell about, so I'll just give the main plot line of what happened. So I had a joke with my girls throughout the week. I had that whole row of girls, Hadley and (coughs) Hannah, then Abby was there as their counselor. They're on the green team. Now obviously, I cannot be with them because they're females and I'm a male. So when we get there, I have no idea where I'm gonna be placed. I have no idea what cabin I'm in. I don't know what team I'm on. I just know I'm there. So I show up and I get asked, hey, could you be with the yellow team? Because the male counselor for the one guy cabin had some real bad medical issues happen two weeks prior. I want to put you with him just to make sure he's okay. If something happens, you can be there, take over, all this kind of stuff. So I said, yeah, sure. So I go and I meet this group of boys. If you have raised boys, or if you are a male yourself, you know what happens when a group of guys come together, especially a group of random guys, because they were from three different churches. Michael, Pastor Michelle's husband, loves to say when two or more boys are gathered, they default to the dumbest one there. (laughs) And that is the truth. So you get two options. You get one option, which is the group of boys that are the troublemakers, they are the jokesters, they're the pranksters, they don't want to be there, they've only been forced to come to camp. Or you get the boys that only care about getting a girlfriend that week at camp, which is a whole other sermon by itself. You get that group of boys, or you get the group of boys that are determined, that are focused, that actually care about what they are doing there and are invested, they're locked in. And I was blessed to have that group of boys. This group of three different churches, two of them are from Georgia, one from Augusta, one from South Georgia. Then this other group of four boys, there's one senior who just graduated going to college, his younger brother, and then two of their friends. This group of boys, drove themselves to camp, and they drove from Myrtle Beach. This group of four boys drove all the way from Myrtle Beach up to Table Rock Camp. No adult, no youth pastor, because they love the camp that much. That was my group of boys that week, and they were amazing, and I loved them so much. In fact, my girls kept having this little rivalry between my group of boys and themselves saying, no, you love us more. Then my guys would say, no, you love us more. (laughs) Then they would fight in the dining hall. But this group of boys, every single night, broke me. Because every single night for the message, for worship, if one of them was up there, they were all up there. This group of boys who have never met before, are suddenly this brotherhood with one another. And every single night, every altar call, if one of them was there, they all went together. So that nobody felt any shyness, no one felt any awkwardness of being out there by themselves, but they went as a unit, and they didn't just stand there and look around, looking all awkward, they prayed for one another. They got down on their knees with one another. And here's another thing, When we pray, we have a tendency to be very still, just be very stoic when we pray. These boys were praying physically. 
They were shaking, they were crying, calling out to God, and the Holy Spirit answered. Every single night, they would not leave until they felt God move in their hearts, and he did. Every single night, tears. It wasn't just my guys, it was my girls as well. Seeing them pray for one another, seeing them worship God together, broke me night after night. If you haven't noticed, I'm a big softie. I may be a large guy, but I'm a big softie. I cry very easily. And they got me every single night. But that was camp. That was what this week was. All throughout the week, night after night, seeing students encounter the Holy Spirit. Seeing lives be changed. Chains fall when the Holy Spirit moved and hearts being made whole. That was what that week was. And all throughout the week, there was this piece of scripture that wasn't even one of the key verses of the week. But I just kept hearing it over and over again. It was the parable of the prodigal son. So I'm going to read to you a chunk of it. It's not the whole parable. Only 13 verses. So I'm going to read Luke 15. Verses 11 through 24. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. Abraham had spent everything there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. In my opinion, there is a huge difference between simply reading scripture and experiencing scripture, being able to witness it around you. That parable is one of my favorites. I love it so much. In that week at camp, I got to witness it happen in front of me time and time again as students went to the altar came to their senses and turned back to the Father and were embraced were made whole again I got to experience my first ever salvation this week one of the boys in my cabin the very first night went to the altar and gave his life to Christ amen. that doesn't make you say amen I don't know what does the joy I felt in that moment, seeing the joy in him, seeing all the ways that God was already working, you could see it on him. That is the difference when we can witness scripture happening in front of us. And that is what camp does when the Holy Spirit is present. He moves, he changes lives. 
And when you encounter him, you're never the same again. And when I was reading this parable throughout the week, just hearing it over and over again, I kept noticing something about it that I wanted to share with y'all. Something that I was realizing and then witnessing in front of me. There are two phrases in the parable that I think we read, but don't fully understand what all is being said. So the first phrase is this. Father, give me my share of the estate. Now we read that line, and we understand it as some greedy kid wanting his money before he's supposed to get it. And that's fair. That's part of it. But think about it like this. When does a person get their inheritance? When that person dies. The younger son is coming up to his father saying, I wish you were dead so that I could have my money. I want you dead so that I could have my money now. And what does the father do? He divides his property, sends the son off, and waits. And what does the son do? The son does exactly what he's been wanting to do. Go off on his own. Do what he thinks is right. And we are the younger son in this story. Before we know Christ, we are the younger son. We go off into this world chasing what we think is right. Chasing what we want out of this life. We go towards the world. And what the world gives us instead of what the Father gives us. We become worldly. We long after the things of this world. We chase after money, power, pleasure. We want the biggest house. We want the nicest car. We want the prettiest partner. We want pleasure unending and no consequences to any of our actions. Because the Father is dead to us. We don't have to fear his discipline. We don't have to fear anything that he has told us to do for fear of crossing the line. Because what line is there to cross now? And this is where the younger son goes. There were students like that at camp. There were people like that in church, wielding the title of Christian. There were people like that out in this world, but who have no idea of the position they find themselves in because they don't know them. They never have been told about the Father. They don't realize what it is that they're doing and where they find themselves in this world. The Father does not run after the Son. And that's important. He waits on Him. Waiting on Him to turn back to Him. And that's where we get the second phrase. When He came to His senses... See, in the parable, the father does not chase after the son, does not run to him and beg him to come back home. He waits. Waits for him to make that choice himself. He allows his son to go off and do whatever it is he wants to do. But the son is lost. He gets stuck in the world that he's been chasing. He ends up broke. His friends suddenly ditch him because now the rich kid's now the broke kid. And he's in this moment of absolute rock bottom. Longing after the food that the pigs eat. And then he comes to his senses. And in the parable, the son does this by himself. It's all internal. He has his own little thought process that he has. And then he comes to his senses and turns back to the father. But here's the beautiful thing. We as Christians don't operate in a bubble. We're called to live life together as a family of believers. When we come to our senses, it's not just by ourselves, or rather it shouldn't be. We go together as a community. We walk alongside each other. Because that is our calling. There were students at camp who had that moment. We turned back to God and were saved. Hearts made whole, chains broken, Holy Spirit 
fill in their hearts. There are people experiencing that all across this world, having that moment. Our job, our calling, is to go out into this world and help people who haven't had that moment yet. We're called to go out into this world and proclaim the gospel through words and actions, showing people who Christ is. We are his messengers. The father doesn't run after the son. He doesn't beg him to come back home. He sends us. We are his messengers out into this world, reminding people of the father that they left behind. Teaching people that they have a father who loves them cares for them and forgives them and wants to make them whole. It's just like there were students at that camp who had this moment. There were students who weren't at that camp. Students who couldn't get together. There are people who aren't in church right now who need to hear this message. There are people out in this world who have been hurt by churches before, who have been hurt by Christians and have closed themselves off even more so and it's our job, our calling, to reach out to them, to show them love, to show them mercy and forgiveness that the prodigal son experienced with the father. It's not just my job to reach these students. It's not just Pastor Mark's job to reach all y'all. It's not just a pastor's job. It's not just a missionary's job. It's all of our jobs and callings to fulfill the Great Commission, to live out a life that points people back to Christ. Because when we do that, we help those around us come to their senses through the sharing of the gospel so that they can encounter the Holy Spirit, so that they can be filled with his love and mercy and be changed forever. That is our calling, to help those around us encounter the Holy Spirit. To close, there is a story that I have from that wicked camp. And if I ever need a story to explain what encountering the Holy Spirit is, it's going to be this story. So it's the final night, Thursday night. Cry night, last time we've ever seen each other, everybody's bawling already. The message has been preached, the altar call has happened, and the final song has been sung. And we're all up in front at the altar, in this old, whole big huddle together. And Heath is coming on stage to dismiss everybody, it's the final cabin time of the week, and then in the morning we leave. As Heath is saying the first word out of his mouth, that senior from my cabin starts singing. And he's singing this song called Gratitude by Brandon Lake. And he's singing The Bridge. It's a song we had sang a couple of times throughout the week. The bridge goes like this. So come on my soul, or don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song, so you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. For six minutes, this entire group of students, because within seconds of him singing, all he had to do was say, oh, come on my soul, and everybody was singing along with him. All these students singing this bridge for six minutes straight over and over again. Oh, come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song, because you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. And they did. They praised God in a way that I've never witnessed and experienced before, and now I can't get it out of my head. Because if I was crying before, it's bad. Like, I'm gone. But these students crying out to God, not afraid of any kind of awkwardness, not afraid of any kind of shyness, but praising God. 
in this moment of spontaneous worship. That is encountering the Holy Spirit. That is what happens when we surrender fully to God and experience Him in our lives. So I have a challenge for you. Have you encountered the Holy Spirit? And if so, how are we going into this world helping people encounter Him as well? Because there is no one in this world who does not deserve an ounce of what that moment was. And they can encounter the Holy Spirit and be changed forever. Pray with me. That's what we do. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you for camp. This moment gather together this catalyst in so many people's face and I pray as we go from this place, as we go from this church, that our faith does not stay here stuck to these seats inside these walls but instead they go with us and the God, your Holy Spirit convicts us and moves us to share the gospel with those around us with strangers, family members, co-workers, friends, loved ones. Because everyone deserves that moment. Everyone needs that moment where the Holy Spirit moves. God, be with us. Let us encounter the Holy Spirit in new ways so that through us, your message can be shown to all those around us, all those broken and hurting and lost in this world. As we bring more prodigal sons and daughters home. We name pray. Amen. All my words won't show. I've got nothing new. I could I Sing these songs as I often do. But every song must end, and you never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you. Oh, my.